1973, I was, I had been producing mostly pop acts. I had begun my career engineering and producing jazz records. And David Geffen, who had become a friend, uh, by that time David had formed Asylum Records and was the head of the label. And one afternoon the phone rang and David called me up and said, can you come down to my office this afternoon? I have an artist that I think you ought to hear. And I went to David's office and he played me uh, a few cuts off the Closing Time album. Uh, oh, Grapefruit Moon, and uh, just one or, two, one or two cuts. And he said, what do you think? And I said, what an interesting artist this guy is. Who is he? He said, well, he's a guy named Tom Waits, and I found him at the Troubadour. He said, I was a hoot night at the Troubadour, and there was Tom on stage performing. And he said, I thought he was really interesting, and so I signed him. And he said, I made this first album with him, and Jerry Yester produced it. I said, yeah, I know Jerry. He was, you know, involved. His brother's one in the associations, somebody that I know. Um, and what I really loved about it was there were those trumpet solos on it, which I thought were, basically it was, had had touches of like jazz. I thought it was sort of like a combination of a folk record and a jazz record. What, very, so, so kind of unique. And of course, his voice was very different. His voice was not as gravelly then as it became. It was smoother then. And when I heard his first demos that he did, it was amazing how close to Bob Dylan he sounded on his first demos. He lived at the Tropicana Motel in Hollywood on, on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard. That was his home. And he would bring the lyric sheets in, and they, the lyrics would be written on stationery for the Tropicana Motel on them, you know? And that's where they began, and he would sit at the piano. To, he didn't write music, so he would just put the lyric up on the piano, and he would play, and he would sing the tune to me. Or he would go in, he always wanted to go in with a, a separate engineer, somebody that would just do the recording of the demo and not have anything to do with what he was going to do artistically. So he would go to a demo studio and just make the demos with an, an engineer he didn't even know, just somebody that, uh, that he could lay the tunes down. And then he would bring them to me and I would listen to them and then we would talk. So this process happened over and over again. Occasionally he would call me and say, you got to hear this tune, I want to play something for you. So it was always this growth and always these ideas. And, and have, you, have you heard this? Have you heard that? And I would say, Tom, you should hear this and that. You know, Pete Chrislieb had played on, uh, on our Nighthawks album, a tenor saxophone player, and had played, you know, for Tom a, a couple of times. And I, I called him up and I said, you know, there's a Steely Dan album called Asia, and Chrislieb is playing on that. Have you heard this record? And I, I gave him the Steely Dan album the first time. You know, so these, this kind of thing was going on all the time. So we weren't paying any attention to critics or, this was like pure de artist development as far as I was concerned. There, were, there was improvisation, there was uh, development, there was no, the only thing that was ever written down and Tom didn't always follow them exactly, were the lyrics. So there, the music that was, the lead sheets that were written for Tom's music were written after we finished the records. They were written from the records, not written first and the records made from them. So they were just, the records were just improvised and put together in the studio with suggestions and changes and whatever happening on the spur of the moment as we were making them. Well, they're like children for me, so I don't actually have a favorite. I can't say, they're all good for different reasons, but there, there is a line through those records that of development and, and the music getting better and the sound getting more interesting, and he, he and Tom becoming more interesting as an artist. 
I mean, we were having fun making these records. That's the first thing you have to understand is that making an album with a rock band is kitchen drudgery because you're in the studio, you're laying basic tracks, you're putting vocals on, you're doing the guitar solos, you're doing, and it's one thing at a time, and there's no, like, one performance. But with weights, there's one performance. There's no overdubbing, there's no mixing down, there's just sequencing the album and trying to get the best feeling out of every tune. And so it's a completely different kind of process. And it's, it's something which, from album to album, there was growth from album to album, and we would revise our process as we went from album to album. So I can't say I like this album best, because every album is different in long that chain of development. There's a, there's a kind of a sad quality about the Foreign Affairs album. There's a, there is a blues quality about Blue Valentine. Um, there's Jersey Girl, which is homage to Bruce Springsteen, to his friend Bruce, you know. Um, there's uh, things in that album that are, uh, you know, kind of brushed by Steely Dan. The, it, each one of those records is part of a development, and we just went where, we, where, where Tom took us. When we were done with, with uh, the one from the heart recording, uh, Tom was looking forward to the next record that he was going to make. What I didn't know was that he was also looking forward to leaving Electra Asylum Records and making a new record deal, which I didn't know. But anyway, that wasn't important to me because my, my relationship with him was artist-producer and wherever he went. I would have been happy to go. And Tom called me up and said, let's, let's meet at Martoni's and have a glass of wine. Martoni's was the notorious hangout in Hollywood for all the record people. So we met uh, at Martoni's and sat down. And Tom said to me, I think I need to find another person to produce my next record. And I said, well, I've never had an exclusive hold on you, Tom. This could end any time you wanted it to end. In fact, he had gone the year before and made some demos with somebody in New York. I found out about it afterward. It wasn't important to me. He was saying where his career was going. I wasn't. I didn't create Tom Waits. Tom Waits created Tom Waits, and I helped him do it. Tom used to say, you hold a stick up for me to jump over, and every album you hold the stick a little higher. And that was my job. And I said, well, just know that if you ever want to make another record with me, I'll be happy to do it. He said, well, the problem that I'm having is that I start writing and I start thinking, I think like you now. And I write a song and I go, I don't know if Bones is going to like this tune. And he said, I'm fine. I'm trying to write for you. I said, I cannot think of a better reason for two people to not work together anymore. Certainly an artist should not work with somebody that they feel like they have to satisfy as a producer. But if you ever want to make another record with me, you know exactly the kind of record we'll make, and I'll be happy to do it. I'll drop everything we'll, to make another record with you. And that's, and that's, we had another glass of wine, and we shook hands, and that was the end of it. And he went off and signed with uh, another record label, and and uh, made Bone Machine, or whatever that other record was, the first record that he made after that. But I would see Tom occasionally. I saw him uh, on the set of Dracula when he was working with Francis, and it was like we hadn't seen each other since last Thursday, and we started talking about... He was producing the Bone Machine record, and he was, we were talking about miking guitars and, you know, the stuff that you do when you have worked together in the studio. And it was very cordial. And come to think of it, I think that's the last time I saw Tom. But he's the only artist that I worked with over all those years that, with the exception of the jazz artists, because a lot of them are still my friends, but he was the only uh, pop artist, although he's not pop, that I worked with all those years that I missed talking to. He was my friend. We, he was fun to talk to. 
we hung out, you know, he was just somebody that I actually miss because he's somebody that I would enjoy talking to today. But his life is completely different now, and so it's, it's gone.